Welcome to Our Lady of Lourdes Parish in Massapequa Park, New York. I'm Monsignor Jim Losanti, welcoming you to our celebration of the 32nd Sunday in Ordinary Time. Let's begin our prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. My friends, the Lord be with you. With your spirit. To better celebrate this Mass, let's take a look at our lives during the past week, where we've sinned, ask the Lord with sorrow for his forgiveness. For any failure to love, to be tolerant, to embrace, and to accept others, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. For our judgment about others without looking at our own sins, Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. For the good we mean to do but don't, for the, the delayed sins of omission, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us all to everlasting life. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to people of good will. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we give you thanks for your great glory, Lord God, Heavenly King, O God, Almighty Father, Lord Jesus Christ, Only Begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us, you take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer, you are seated at the right hand of the Father, have mercy on us, for you alone are the Holy One, you alone are Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. And so we pray. Let us pray for health in mind and body and soul. God of power, God of mercy, protect us from all harm. Give us the freedom of spirit and health in mind and body to do each day your work on earth. And we ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet, I'm sorry, the reading from the book of wisdom. Resplendent and unfading is wisdom, and she is readily perceived by those who love her and found by those who seek her. She hastens to make herself known in anticipation of their desire. Whoever watches for her at dawn shall not be disappointed, for he shall find her sitting by his gate. For taking thought of wisdom is the perfection of prudence, and whoever for her sake keeps vigil shall quickly be free from care. Because she makes her own rounds, seeking those worthy of her, and graciously appears to them in the ways and meets them with all selectude. The word of the Lord. Praise be to God. The Responsorial Psalm. My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord, my God. My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord, my God. O God, you are my God whom I seek. For you, my flesh pines and my soul thirsts. Like the earth parched, lifeless, and without water, my soul is thirsting for you, O Lord, my God. Thus I have gazed toward you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. For your kindness is a greater good than life. My lips shall glorify you. My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord my God. Thus I will bless you while I live. Lifting up my hands, I will call upon your name. As with the riches of a banquet shall my soul be satisfied, and with exultant lips my mouth shall praise you. My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord my God. I will remember you upon my couch. And through the night watches, I will meditate on you. You are my help, and in the shadows of your wings, I shout for joy. My soul is thirsting for you, my Lord, my God. A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Thessalonians. We do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, about those who have fallen asleep so that you may not grieve like the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose, so too will God, through Jesus, bring with him those who have fallen asleep. 
Indeed, we tell you this on the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will surely not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself, with a word of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, will come down from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus, we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, console one another with these words. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord, be in my heart and on my lips, that I might worthily proclaim your gospel through the Father, Son, and Spirit. Amen. My friends, the Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus told his disciples this parable. The kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. The foolish ones, when taking their lamps, brought no oil with them. But the wise brought flasks of oil with their lamps. Since the bridegroom was long delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight there was a cry, Behold, the bridegroom comes. Come out to meet him. Then all those virgins got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the wise ones replied, No, for there may not be enough for us and you. Go instead to the merchants and buy some for yourselves. While they went off to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went into the wedding feast with him. Then the door was locked. Afterwards, the other virgins came and said, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he said in reply, Amen, I say to you, I do not know you. Therefore, stay awake. For you know neither the day nor the hour. And this is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks for being with us at Our Lady of Lourdes to celebrate this 32nd Sunday in Ordinary Time. Let's get right to the readings. The first reading is from the Book of Wisdom and seems to highlight for us the notion that to live in God is to live in wisdom that the truly godly person should reflect the wisdom of God, which this reading says is resplendent and unfading. So let's focus a little bit on wisdom and see whether or not you and I are living in that godly virtue, that godly value. Um, In Old Testament times, one of the best examples of wisdom we're taught is the reign of King Solomon, who was not only a great king, but also a wise man. And you know the story, which is told time and time again, of the two women brought to him before there was any such thing as DNA testing, who both claimed to be mother of a child. Now, he couldn't tell who was really the mother, and so Solomon, who had the gift of wisdom, the godly gift, knew that the only way to determine the truth was to look into the heart of those two people standing in front of him. And so he comes up with a solution, not one I think he actually planned to execute, but one to test the women. Okay, since I can't determine, he said, who is the mother of the child? Let me be fair. Let me take my sword and cut the child in half and give you each half a child. The one woman who was not the real mother said, sounds fair to me. The woman who truly was the mother said, no. If that's the solution, then give this other woman the baby, but let the baby live. What Solomon was doing was looking into the hearts of those women, and he knew that no true mother, no loving mother, would want to see her child die. He had the gift of wisdom, the ability, not only to intelligently decipher what was going on inside those women, but a sense of compassion and empathy. He resonated with what a true mother would feel and say, and he got it right. That's the gift of wisdom. Now, if you and I would live in wisdom, if we would be godly in the sense of being people reflecting the wisdom of God, we should also be people of wisdom. But how does that happen? How can we become like Solomon? We're told that wisdom is best demonstrated by the gift of prudence. In other words, if you're really wise, you come up with the ability to make wise decisions, prudent decisions. And what does it mean to make a prudent decision? Let's talk about that. It's the ability to look into another person's heart and to recognize the things in their heart that reflect what they truly value. 
And the prudent person chooses wisely the way in which we relate to one another. And it never includes, and this is important, true wisdom never includes what we call the ad hominem attack. An ad hominem attack is a personal attack. I I can't convince you that your ideas are wrong, so I attack you personally. It's always a sign of our ineffectiveness in terms of being people of true wisdom. We want to always avoid the ad hominem. Good example of this, of where people can in fact disagree with ideas but not be disagreeable about people. The late Justice Antonin Scalia had as one of his closest friends Judge Ruth Ginsburg. Now, you could not find ideologically two more completely opposed people. I mean, they were truly from two extremes, both of which were opposed to the other. Yet they regularly went to opera together, they took vacations together, they regularly dined with their respective spouses. They were good, close friends. How could this be? They disagreed about almost everything. And it's because, as Justice Scalia said long ago, I never attack people, I only attack their ideas. That's the gift of wisdom, the ability to not only see with compassion and intelligence, but also to see beyond the personal ad hominem and to recognize the truly wise person disagrees with ideas. Recently, we had another example of that at the judiciary hearings over the confirmation of uh, Judge Amy Coney Barrett. Uh, One of the people challenged her, well, how will you get along with the Chief Justice? After all, you disagree with him on this and that. And she said, oh, I disagree with the Chief Justice's ideas, but I have no problem at all with the Chief Justice. That's the ability that we see in the Supreme Court that we need to bring into our daily lives. And unfortunately, in America right now especially, this gift of wisdom seems to be lacking. We mix up the fact that I can disagree with your ideas, but I'm not going to be disagreeable about you as a person. The gift of wisdom is the ability to look into another person's heart and to see that beyond their ideas with which you may disagree, there's a person worthy of God's love. Can we, please God, get to a point of disagreeing respectfully and still love the person with whom we disrespect? Uh, we, we disagree, I should say. Let me uh, suggest to you, too, another way we can do this. And, and I've seen this many times in discussion. I present an idea to someone and they say back to me, no, 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 it's not that at all. This is what it is. Well, as soon as they said, no, 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 I can't possibly listen to their point of view. But a better way to approach that person would be, I give an idea, and you say, you know, Jim, that's true, but you know what else is true? You add a positive onto my perspective. You don't deny what I'm saying. In order for us to be people of prudence, people of wisdom, we've got to learn not only to respect the people who have a different point of view, but also even to recognize that their point of view is worthy of respect. It may not be ours. We may politely disagree. We may add on to what they say in a positive way but we mustn't strike down either people or their ideas with ad hominem, negative, critical thinking and actions and words. Wisdom, the ability to truly see what's important, the ability to be prudent, is something we're called on by God to say as as a godly value, is something we all need to live more fully. I, I don't succeed at that, maybe you don't either. But we're called to embrace the gift of God's wisdom and to live that fully. Let's go to the second reading. Great stuff from St. Paul to the Thessalonians. And I'll make this short and sweet. I hope you get a chance to read a book that came out years ago by Todd Burpo called Heaven is for Real. So he has this little boy who uh, gets into a medical crisis. And when he's in that medical crisis, in the hospital, being operated on, he's gone for a while. He has a near-death experience. The little boy comes back. And he knows things that he couldn't possibly know from his five years of life on earth. He's able to describe a grandfather he never met. He sees an unborn child in his mother's womb who died years before that he was never told about. And they come slowly to recognize that this boy, for a while when he left the body in that period during his surgery, had an experience that was other. It was the experience of heaven. And what St. Paul is saying in this writing is, it's for real. You know, I think some people think, I remember one time doing a funeral where a good friend of mine who's Jewish came, and her name is Jill, and she listened to my homily, and she said, I think you people have such a wonderful religion in that you give people all these comforting thoughts about death. And I said, you know, Jill, they are comforting, but they're not just ideas we sell to people to make them feel better. We really believe it. We truly believe that this human journey is part of the story, but definitely not the whole story, and that there's life yet to come. Again, this idea of heaven, this life beyond our life, the life promised by Christ, eternal life, 
is not a nice idea to make people feel not so bad when they lose somebody they love. It's for real. Heaven is for real. That's the name of the book by Todd Burpo, which was then made into a movie starring Greg Kinnear. Very much worth a watch because it highlights for us the reality of what our faith tells us. We have this life on earth, and it's part of the story, but it is far from the whole story. Heaven is for real. Eternal life is real. We are promised that by Christ, and when Christ makes a promise to you and me, you can take it to the bank. And his promise is this life is part of the story, but not the whole story. Let's go finally to the gospel, this gospel of Matthew. The foolish virgins versus the wise virgins. One set of virgins are prepared, the other are not. I'm going to suggest to you that many of us, if not most of us, are the foolish virgins. We live our lives as if it's going to go on and on forever. We act as if we've got all the time in the world. And I think what this reading is reminding us of is that we don't. And as the closing line of the gospel says, since you don't know and I don't know when we're going to be called home, wouldn't prudence, going back to the first reading, suggest that we should be wise enough to be ready today? Not manana, not domani, not down the line, but today. I don't know how much time I have, how much time you have. And so isn't true wisdom, which is not demonstrated by the foolish virgins, found in being able to say, I'm ready? You know, when I see this, I ask people very often in my parish, a common question I ask is, by the way, do you have a a will all set up? Uh, No, 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 I I mean to get to that. How about a living will, you know, someone to make decisions if you medically can't? Well, I'm definitely going to get to that someday. Who are we kidding? We deny the ability to make plans for the future, and we leave chaos for our heirs. Why? Because we don't want to face the reality. We're scared to death of death. And yet we're being told by the Lord, look, I promised you in that second reading, eternal life, you don't need to be overwhelmingly frightened. And every time you delay and you become foolish and unplanned, you in fact are saying, I'm not ready to meet my maker and I don't truly believe in the life yet to come. Let's not be the foolish virgins. Let's not be those people who aren't ready. Now, how do you get ready? Well, I suggested making a will or a living will. That's one piece of it. But the other is to start to ask ourselves Am I living today, not someday, the meaningful life I always hoped for? And I have to tell you, after 40 years of priesthood and celebrating way too many funerals, a meaningful life, it seems to me, is not all that complicated. Are you loving your God? Are you loving your family? Do you love your country? And by that, I mean your neighbor. You get those three things right. And I can promise you that if today is the day you're called home or I'm called home, We've got a God who will truly say, well done. But the time to get ready is not down the line. The time to get ready and to be the wise virgins is today. If you listen to this homily and if you can decide today, I'm going to finally get organized. I'm going to finally get my life ready. I'm going to finally embrace and actually live the meaningful life that I've been called to live. Then we will have learned from the foolish virgins what not to do and will have the wisdom of the wise virgins to be well-planned and ready to meet our God with the confidence that this life is only part of the story and that a great life awaits us in eternal life, not a nice idea, not a comforting thought, but the real deal, because heaven is for real. Okay, a couple of other thoughts I wanted to share with you, um, especially now, you know, in this election season, as the election is technically over, but they're still counting the ballots, Here's what I see, and it frightens me. We're a great country. We obviously are very divided. But at the bottom of the line of this whole story is we've got to respect the different points of view. We are much too guilty right now of what I call demonization. We decide that if you don't agree with me, there must be something evil about you. There must be something terrible. I actually have a friend, a liberal friend from California, who said to me this week, you know, if Trump could get that many votes, clearly... We have half the country who are deplorables, using that terrible expression that Hillary Clinton had used four years ago. What a horrible perspective on your fellow countrymen and women to decide that because somebody disagrees with you that, in fact, they're terrible, terrible people. This goes back to my point about ad hominem attacks. Disagree with ideas respectfully, but don't decide that people themselves are bad because they don't see things the way you do. How much have we fallen as a country that we don't recognize our strength is in our unity of purpose? Different ideas, that's the greatness of democracy, to be sure. But not to demonize people by deciding, if you have a different candidate than I do, then you must be evil. 
You must be terrible. Look at how awful you are. Stop it. I disagree with your ideas, as Justice Scalia said, but I will not be disagreeable as a person about and with you. An example of what I'm talking about. I have a, uh, a good friend named Jennifer, and she goes to college, has some wonderful friends, but uh, two of her friends challenged her after the election. Did you vote, and how did you vote? And she finally, in a moment of candor, admitted that she had voted for President Trump. Well, one of her friends is a, a gay person, a lesbian, and this is what she had to say in her text to Jennifer. Well, you basically said, you don't give a damn about me and my life and people like me. Uh, under this man that you voted for, all my rights will be taken away. Well, that's not only an exaggeration, but it's untrue. And then her friend who's African-American wrote her when she heard that she had voted for Trump. If you voted for Trump, you voted against me and the whole black community. Why can't we allow people, whether they voted for Mr. Biden or Mr. Trump, to just have their perspective, disagree politely and respectfully, even work against their point of view within the process of our democracy, but not demonize people? You know, I regularly, regularly interview people on that show I do, personally speaking, who are not only not Catholic, and not only other Christians or Jews or Muslims or Buddhists, but I regularly have people on who are agnostics who say, I'm not sure if there's a God. I regularly have people on the show who say, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God at all. Now, you would think that about five minutes into the show, I should say, get off my channel. Never happens. I want to find out why they gave up believing in God if they ever did. I want to find out where are their doubts. I can only learn to become a better person by understanding people who don't agree. I want to see their perspective. What I'm saying is whether it's about politics or religion or any issue, let's be open to the possibility that the other side has something to say, and I will listen. I may prudentially and respectfully disagree, but for the sake of our country, for the sake of all that's good and holy and, and possible for the future, let's not demonize one another. Half the country went one way and the other half went the other way. If America is to be the great country that you and I know it can and has been, it will only happen by both sides saying, I respectfully disagree. In prudence, I have a different perspective. You know, you might be a little right, but I hope you'll be open to my ideas as well. And together, we can work to truly make America the great country that it's meant to be. As a people of faith, let's now profess the words of our creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him, through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And now with confidence in God's goodness and his love for us, let's dare to present to him our prayers of petition. Our response is, Lord, hear our prayer. That the church leaders throughout the world continue to call all people to holiness. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That God's people, who proclaim that death has been conquered in Christ, may be active in defending his gift of life. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That those who work for peace and struggle for justice will bring the message of salvation to our world. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That those in our parish and family members who are ill may enjoy the consolation of the Lord and the presence of their loved ones, especially 
Mary Rose Brosnan, Silham Denho, Patricia O'Neill, George Moritz, Tony Goodice, Anne Marie Tenay, Jean Glessing. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all those who have died, especially Louis, Lucille Camerata, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And for the intention of this Mass, whom we remember at the Eucharist, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Let's pray especially for the intentions of this Mass, for Richard Rosmarin, for Helen Bandish, for Anne and Dom Polito. We pray as well for the well-being of Patrick O'Neill. I'm going to ask you to pray with me, too, for a number of people who are not well and have asked for prayers. Let me ask you to pray for my friend Corinne Locke. I want to ask you to pray for baby Thomas Matthew, who's undergone serious surgery, Roy Citrano, Megan Tog, young lady over in Ireland. I want to pray for Jack Daly, grandson of my friends Bill and Joan, uh, for Joan Donovan herself in Florida, for Heidi Ignoski and Anthony Scotto, for Tracy Warshawski and Jack Carroll, for Judge Anthony Falanga. I want to pray for Alex Haliasos. I want to pray for Van Tutwiler and Sophia Maglione, for Howie Pomerantz, for Marilyn Arbogast and Nancy Palumbo. Rick, who's the father of my friend Matt, who's just been diagnosed with stage four pancreatic, we pray for Rick, Jorge Clemente and Anthony Kremi. For Melissa Bergman, let me pray for Nick Castellano, still recovering from his serious motorcycle accident. For Jim Harmon, for Stacy and her beautifully evolving unborn child. For Tom O'Sullivan and for Richard Bastian. For Paul Steschut, for Gary Hudson, for the Cousins family members who are sick for Michael Cataldi and Judith Crum. Let me pray too for Noah Torelli, seven years old, facing serious brain surgery. Pray for Alyssa O'Brien. I also want to pray for many other people who have passed away and the families have asked us to pray for them. So if you'll bear with me, these are important to them, certainly. I want to pray for um, uh, Eleanor Mazzi, uh, nine years old, passed away. I want to pray for Brian Hussey and Suzanne Scanio, my dear friend. For Ronald Cacioppo, for Kate Kelly, for Connie and Sal Cusimano, for Ted Scorcia and Jerry Monk, for Dave Robin and Matthew Toriello, for Vita Palmieri and Kathleen Smith, for John Arturi, Connor and Will Robles, for Marianne Hayes and Pat Cronin, for John Slee, John and Alma Kappa, Michael Manzella, Kenny Bolando, for Christina Formato and Cynthia Prague, for Gaetano, Sal and Angelo Emelo, Anthony Preziosi, for Pauline Romano and June and Ed Jandovitz, for Mary and Charlie Nobile, Linda Nobile O'Brien, Billy Taylor, for Robbie Purick. I want to pray for Jimmy Soldo and Richard Jackal and Barry Champney. I pray for George Floyd and Ronnie Bedix and Scott Pollock. I pray for Norma Calabrese, Jerry Pangalo, Michael Pangalo, Pat Cesar, Emily Lafaso, Joe and Marion Bacigalupo, Monica Kerrison. I pray for Peggy Barr, Dale Louise Odin. I pray for Jerry and Edward Casal, for Ed Alma, for Judge Don Belfi, for Tino DiBello, for Jen Guardino, Gary and Mike Scorsia, Nick Martone, Raymond Kennedy, Leon, Leon Sherman Jr., for Marisa Colo, Father Tim Hurton, for Bill Kelly. I pray for Captain Timothy Murray and Thomas O'Shea, for Peggy and Joe Bauman, for John Glauda, for Dottie Lauer. And for all of our friends and relatives who we pray are now happily enjoying the greatness of heaven. I want to pray as well as we always do for all those fighting the pandemic, for doctors and nurses and EMTs, for those seeking a cure to this terrible COVID-19. I want to pray as well for my friend Chris, who's been infected by this. I want to pray too as well for all of our men and women in the armed forces and for all those who are there for us when it really matters. Uh, our police, our firefighters, those people on the front lines. I always pray especially for Connell Asante and for Thomas Scanio. I want to send out a shout out to my friend Byrne as she celebrates this week her 85th birthday. For all these intentions and for all that we keep silently in our hearts, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And join me in taking all these intentions and offering them to the Mother of God as together we say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen.
Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. By the mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ, who humbled himself to share in our humanity. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have this wine to offer. Fruit of the vine, work of human hands, it will become for us our spiritual drink. Blessed, Blessed be God, God forever. Lord God, we ask you to receive us and be pleased with the sacrifice we offer you with humble and contrite hearts. Lord, wash away my iniquity. Cleanse me from all of my sin. Pray, my brothers and sisters, that our sacrifice will be found acceptable to God, our Heavenly Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at our hands to the praise and the glory of his name for our good and the good of all his church. God of love, God of mercy, in this Holy Eucharist we proclaim the death of the Lord. Accept the gifts we present and help us to follow him always with love, for he truly is our Lord forever and ever. Amen. My friends, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father, it is our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks to your beloved Son, Jesus the Christ. He is the Word through whom you made the universe, the Savior you sent to redeem us. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh and was born of the Blessed Virgin Mary. For our sake, he opened his arms on the cross. He put an end to death and revealed the resurrection. In this, he fulfilled your will and he won for you a holy people. So now, we join with all the angels and saints in proclaiming your glory as together we say, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Lord, you are holy indeed. You are the fount of all holiness. Let your spirit come upon these gifts of bread and wine to make them holy so that they may become for us the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Before he was given up to death, a death which he freely accepted out of love for us, Jesus took bread in his sacred hands and gave you, Father, thanks and praise. He broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. When supper was ended, Jesus took a chalice filled with the fruit of the vine. Again, Father, he thanked you for your goodness, gave the chalice to his disciples and friends, And he said, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of our faith. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. In memory of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Father, this life-giving bread, this saving cup. We thank you for counting us worthy to be in your presence and to minister to you. Humbly, we pray that by partaking in the body and blood of Christ, we might all be united as one family through the grace of the Holy Spirit. Lord, remember your church spread throughout the world and make us grow in love together with Francis, our Pope, John, our Bishop, along with all the bishops, the clergy, the religious, and all of God's people. We ask you to bless and remember all of our brothers and sisters, all of our relatives and friends who have gone to their rest in the hope of rising again. Bring them and all the departed into the light of your presence. Have mercy on us all and make us worthy to share eternal life with Mary, the Virgin Mother of God, with St. Joseph, her devoted spouse, and with all the saints and martyrs and angels who have done your will throughout the ages. May we praise you in union with them and give you glory through your Son and our brother, Jesus Christ the Lord. For it is through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, 
that all glory, all honor is yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We're going to pray now together the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that Jesus taught us. We say the Our Father, may our intention be that we will be like the wise virgins, people by virtue of the meaning of our lives are ready to meet our Lord on any day he calls. In that hope we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, from every evil, and grant us peace in our day. In your mercy, keep us free from sin. Protect us from all anxiety as we wait in joyful hope for the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, I leave you my peace. My peace I give to you, look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and grant us the peace and unity of your kingdom, where you live and reign, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. With you, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, grant us peace. Lord Jesus Christ, with faith in your love and mercy, we eat your body and drink your blood. Let it not bring us condemnation, but health in mind and in body. My friends, behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. May the body and blood of Christ bring us all to share in everlasting life. Amen. An act of spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. just like to, as we uh, gallop toward the Thanksgiving season, do two things. First of all, thank you, many of you who have already contributed to helping us be able to feed so many people who are going through hard times, especially this particular Thanksgiving and holiday season. So many of you have been generous, both in our own parish of Our Lady of Lourdes and people from around the country and around the world. We're so grateful for your goodness. And for those of you who have not yet had a chance to not only take care of your own needs this upcoming holiday season, but the needs of people that you may never get to know, but are neighbors in need, please, this time to give, and please do. Uh, fill our food pantry, come up with the, the gifts we need to be able to gift those families that have so little this year, both the Thanksgiving and Christmas. And uh, I'm sure that the Lord will be so grateful for our goodness. Let's respond to the need. Just as this year has been a tough year for many people, it's been especially tough for some. And we want to help them uh, so that someday, God willing, the Lord will say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you have given us, through this holy sacrament, a sign that even now we continue to share your life. May we come to possess it more completely in the heavenly kingdom where you live forever and ever. Amen. My friends, the Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you and your families. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Mass is ended. Let us go in peace. Thanks be to God. Thanks for joining us at Our Lady of Lourdes for Mass. Delighted that you're part of the community. 
You know, aside from working as pastor at Our Lady of Lourdes, I also host a weekly show called Personally Speaking, where I get a chance to interview people in public life about their faith, their values, the things that matter to them. Some people have a deep sense of faith, some none at all. People like Kurt Warner, the great NFL player, talked about his deep love for Jesus Christ recently. Uh, we've had the opportunity to have people like Nicholas Sparks, the great author on our show. Uh, we've had all sorts of people, and some people who don't share faith at all, but just respect and admire the willingness to dialogue about it. I'll give you an example, Ed Asner, nine-time winner of the Emmy Award, the great actor. Uh, it's said in his biography that he calls himself an atheistic Jewish man. So I asked him, uh, Ed, you're now in your early 90s. Let me ask you, are you still an atheist? And he said, well, the closer I get to the end of my life, the more I'm hoping you people are right. Well, you know, that's exactly what we try to do, get people to engage in dialogue on what they believe, what they value, what's most important to them. I'd like to invite you to join us in being a part of Personally Speaking simply by going to YouTube. And when you go to YouTube, you punch in uh, Personally Speaking with Monsignor Jim Lasanti. And when you're listening to our show, please subscribe and hit like button. And if you would, that would be a great thing for us. It's called Personally Speaking with Monsignor Jim Lasanti. We hope you'll join us there.